HCAM News is supported by our viewers and by Hopkinton Drug, located in this historic New England town since 1954. They are a multifaceted store dedicated to providing clients with an array of health care options. And by Webster First Federal Credit Union, providing financial products with attentive customer service to the local families and businesses of Hopkinton. Visit us at WebsterFirst.com. Hello and welcome to HCAM News, Tom Nappy at the Anchor Desk to fill you in with the latest happenings in Hopkinton. On this edition of HCAM News, I caught up with Hopkinton Water and Sewer Manager Eric Cardi and got a look at the new DPW facility. Matt Clark has our HCAM Insider and we have the latest Hiller Sports update. But first, here are some happenings in town you should know about. This past Monday, the planning board meeting aired live on HCAM. There were two public hearings. The first public hearing was regarding the Chamberlain Street Wayland Road project. REC Hopkinton LLC proposed a 32 lot single family subdivision between Chamberlain Street and Wayland Road. Kathy Sherry of REC Hopkinton LLC Describe the plan for the proposed conventional subdivision. So, as most everyone can probably recall, we were before the planning board last year for seeking a special permit for an open space and landscape preservation development for a 32 lot subdivision to be located on the 102 acres that Mr. Mastriani owns between Whalen Road and Chamberlain Street. That special permit was denied by the board, so we're, we're back here seeking approval for a definitive subdivision plan for a 32 lot conventional subdivision. So having spent several months during the open space special permit process, multiple meetings with the planning board, ComCom, data review, and obviously hearing the concerns raised by the neighbors, we did incorporate a lot of those comments and the feedback received during that process into the plan that you have before you tonight and that we submitted. So this design is consistent with the conventional subdivision concept plan that we did show you briefly at the very last open space public hearing that we were at. And actually the, this conventional per plan is somewhat of a hybrid plan in that overall the development complies with the zoning bylaws, the use and dimensional requirements. It also complies with any, everything under the subdivision regs and regulations while also preserving about 45 acres of the site as open space. So it, it would be our intent that those, <coughs> those 45 acres would be permanently protected, preserving the wetlands, the streams, the potential vernal pool, as well as some of the historic features that we've discussed previously on the site. The common open space, again, about abuts town-owned land with the high school and Berry Acres. So that would allow for the continuation and extension of the trail system. So we are proposing as part of our plan to relocate and connect trails that currently run through private property, relocating that into the common open space, <coughs> as well as improving some trail conditions within the wetlands. So that's the open space side high level of the plan. The proposed 32 single family homes would be located within the agricultural zoned land within the 102 acres. And that would be accessed through what we're proposing is an extension of the Whalen Road cul-de-sac as well as an extension of the Chamberlain Street cul-de-sac being connected with a gated emergency access road. Under the new design, Paul Mastriani of REC Hopkinton LLC plans to use a gated emergency access road to create the extension and connection between the two dead-end streets, Chamberlain Street and Whalen Road. The discussion regarding the proposed Chamberlain Street Whalen Road conventional subdivision plan will continue at the planning board meeting February 12th at 8 p.m. The second public hearing at this past Monday's planning board meeting was regarding the Whisper Ridge Open Space Landscape Preservation Development and Flexible Community Development Special Permits. The plan proposed by 20th Century Homes 
proposed a 22-lot single-family subdivision off Whisper Way and payment in lieu of two affordable housing units. Just brief overview, it's a 47.2 acre subdivision, 24 units, um, common septic system, and currently this one house over here, two houses over here, and one house over here. The one uh, close to Wood Street will be demolished. Those two also will be replaced. This one will remain. Um, <clears throat> we will have 3,500 feet of 20 foot wide road. And uh, all together, we will have 25 uh, acres of open space. Uh, what changed since last time we met? Uh, you requested us to uh, do a more detailed, to take a more detailed look on the wetlands, which we did. The discussion of the 20th Century Homes plan regarding the 7.2 acre subdivision consisting of 24 units will continue at the planning board meeting February 12th at 7 p.m. You can view the full public airing from this past Monday on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash HCAMTV. This past week, there was a whole lot of Hillers basketball and hockey action. Let's get a look at the latest highlights as Hopkinton makes the push towards the playoffs. The Hopkinton Hillers hockey team took on Ashland on Saturday, January 20th. It was another scoring fest for the Hillers. It's two on two. And that one is stolen away by Hunter Temple. Temple coming up the ice pretty quick. On the right circle, leaves it behind. The wrister, oh, that's a goal! Sean Walsh getting in on the action early on. It's a great breakout play. The Hill is quite Ashley and changing too. One of the defensemen was going off right as the Hill has started their break. Caught him with a three on two. Walsh day around the net. Temple knocks it back around. It's picked up by Walsh. Out in front and we got another goal. And this time it's Tommy Hamblett. Well that's a real quick start for the Hill is there. Two in less than a minute. That goal was 12 seconds after the first goal in this game. Now on the far side, Hamblett. Back to Walsh. Jarrett, and that one's in! A, a nice deflection. Tip. Was that Hamlet who got the I think it might have been Walsh. I think Walsh might have got the tip. All right, I'll go with you on that one. I'm sorry, Kyle Rogers. I think it was Rogers, actually. Kyle ah. Rogers. Hillers, I'm sure, or excuse me, Ashton, I'm sure, pretty frustrated. As and Will Abbott is going to frustrate them more with another goal. The right winger on a beauty of a wrister. We are 36 seconds into the second period, and Will Abbott has scored the fourth Hiller's goal of this game. Sloan picks it up behind the net. Here he comes into the neutral zone. Sloan picks it up ahead. Around the net, Simos leaving it out in front and the shot, and that is going to be another goal for Will Abbott. His second goal of the game, just making a, it look easy. Just a great play by Samos behind the net, was able to pick that puck up, and Abbott stopped right in front, and he just had it right on a stick. One with 11.07 left to go. Now the Hillers working on the power play here, trying to make it number six. Along the near side, Lindquist, top of the left circle, and he'll risk that one, and it's loose, and then poking it in, Steven Simos. Six nothing Hillers. Just a great play by Samos, right in front. Ready to jump on that loose puck for the rebound. Some, uh, great players on their roster this season. And they're 5, 4, and 2 heading into this one. Quick break here, opportunity for a seventh goal, and there it is. Kyle Rogers scores his second goal of the game. The Hopkinton Hillers get the 7-0 victory and improve to nine wins, one loss, one tie on the season. Hillers boys basketball took on Norwood last Sunday afternoon. Hopkinton outscored Norwood in both quarters of the first half, 14-9 in the first and 14-12 in the second, to lead 28-21 at the half. Ryan Kester drained three three-pointers in the first quarter. The Hillers' offense really came alive in the second half. 
24 points in the third quarter, 16 in the fourth quarter. Hopkinton took the 68 to 54 win to improve to 6 and 6 on the season. Then on Monday, January 22nd, the Hillers girls took on a very good Foxborough team out of the Hockamock. Hopkinton entered this game on a two-game losing streak. Foxborough outscored Hopkinton both quarters of the first half, 15-13 in the first and 13-11 in the second to lead 28-24 at the halftime break. The third quarter was back and forth as both teams scored 16 apiece. Regan Caveney chipped in seven points in the quarter. The Hillers trailed by four heading into the final eight minutes. And then Regan Caveney came through huge, posting another seven points in the quarter. The Hillers trailed by one with six seconds left and needed a bucket to win the game. Ball inside to Goglin. Not there. They fake the handoff. She drives Gladue with it. Ten seconds. Looks like they're going to be looking to take the final shot. Morningstar drives, and takes one. the contact, up and in oh. with the shot. Lily Morningstar. That's huge. No timeout called. Two, Sykes for one. the win. No wow. good. Too strong. Hopkinton with the 55 to 54 victory. Wow. A beauty of a pick set up by Ivy Goglin allows Lily Morningstar to lay it in, and the Hopkinton Hiller girls come up with the 55 to 54 come from behind win to improve to eight and three on the season. Tuesday night, the Hopkinton Hillers boys basketball team taking on Medway. Hillers outscored Medway in the first quarter 12 to 11, but the second quarter tipped in favor of Medway 16 to 12. It was 27 to 24, Medway leading at the halftime break. In the third quarter, Medway struggled offensively and only put up five points, while the Hillers knocked down 13. It was a 37-32, Hillers lead heading into the fourth. In the fourth quarter, Brennan Kelly chipped in with a pair of field goals. He was the team leader, tallying 15 points overall. The Hopkinton Hillers captured the 55-45 win over the Medway Mustangs. Medway falls to five and seven on the year, while the Hillers are now seven and six, and three wins away from clinching a playoff spot. Coming up next on HCAM News, I talked with Hopkinton Water and Soar Manager Eric Cardi, and Matt Clark has our HCAM Insider, plus a whole lot more you won't want to miss. Stay tuned. HCAM programming is supported by our viewers. Thank you. And by Golden Pond Assisted Living, honoring resident choice, dignity, and independence. Our health and wellness focus keeps residents active. Golden Pond, state-of-the-art senior housing and health care services. Hello, my name is Rick Flannery, and I am the chair of the Center School Reuse Advisory Team. With the upcoming opening of the Marathon Elementary School in the fall of 2018, the Board of Selectmen formed the Center School Reuse Advisory Team to explore the future of Center School. We will recommend a plan for the Center School building and property that will provide outside viewpoints on its use and development. This plan will outline the community's vision, your vision, for the future use of the property and produce recommendation for the board's consideration. Here at HCAM, they have asked you, what would you do if someone gave you a television station? The Center School Reuse Advisory Team is asking, what would you do with a school building? Please come and share your vision for the future of Center School with us at the first public forum on Saturday, February 3rd, 2018 at 10 a.m. at the Hopkins Senior Center. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you there. Welcome back to HCAM News. The new Hopkinton DPW facility is up and running, and Hopkinton Water and Sewer Manager Eric Carty joined me to show off the new facility and talk about how the Hopkinton DPW is faring with the many different weather patterns we have seen this winter. We're here today at the uh, new DPW facility. Um, can you talk about when you guys moved in and how it was getting settled in and uh, 
kind of about the process of uh, getting this new facility and how long it took to get settled in here. Yeah, well, thanks, Tom. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the citizens of Hopkinton for uh, uh, voting for us to get this nice new facility here. Uh, definitely needed and very welcomed by all the staff down here. Uh, we're finally able to get all that equipment in under one roof. Uh, we were paying you know, a lot of money for some of the bigger trucks that had to sit outside over the years, so now it's nice to have this brand new facility uh, up and running. Uh, we moved in just a little bit, probably after the 1st of January. Uh, and it was right about the start we had of the cold snap, so we kind of trying to rush to get everything in here. Uh, took a few weeks to get everything organized. Once we got in, it was still doing some uh, uh, minor work on the building here. Uh, so we've been working kind of around the contractors uh, while they're here. Uh, but just it, it's really worked out. Uh, this is a great central location, which is good for us too. It was nice being down on Fruit Street, but it's a lot further to respond when we got to go down to the east side of town. So it's nice to be back at a central location, uh, be able to, to operate out of a, a great brand new building here. Excellent. And um, I understand that you've been pretty busy lately. It's been, uh, we had a, a huge cold stretch where it was record setting uh, cold temperatures. Can you talk about uh, some of the things you guys had to deal with throughout the course of the winter so far? Yeah, sure, sure. As you know, I like to follow the weather. And uh, unfortunately, I don't like to follow it when I have to work in it. <laughs> and we had just a, a brutal stretch, which really started uh, just before Christmas time. And I think we had 10 straight days where the temperatures didn't come out of the 20s, which is the first time that that's happened, at least in the Boston area, in over 100 years. Uh, and what that did to, uh, uh, with us is unfortunately uh, when we get that uh, amount of cold, it just wreaks havoc with the water system. Many of the pipes in town here are old cast iron. And unfortunately, the, the water in the water tanks is at the t outside temperature. So we had a couple of days, I mean, we were below zero, uh, negative three, negative six. And when that cold water just rushes through and hits the cast iron pipe, it unfortunately causes the, uh, the mains to break. Uh, we had a stretch of, I think, three breaks in uh, four days. So the guys, uh, and not only that, but the guys were out dealing with uh, some of the snowstorms we had. So all of the water and sewer guys plow as well. It was a couple of the breaks where they had worked close to 20 something hours after being out all night plowing. We had a couple of breaks come in. Uh, so I, I can't say enough about the guys that work here. They do a great job. Uh, after all those hours, they uh, still came in and helped get the uh, water restored so that we get water back up and running for people. We've also had probably half a dozen or so uh, freeze ups that we've had to go into people's cellars. We have a machine that thaws the water line out. We have to run it through their pipe outside to the ground because the frost was just so thick from that uh, quick amount of cold that we had there, you know, right through up until about a week or so ago uh, where it finally broke. Uh, unfortunately, looking at the weather trends, it looks like uh, starting next weekend we're going to be not quite to that level, but uh, the cold is coming back. So the, the, what really gets us is the fluctuating temperature going from uh, cold back to warm and that's what uh, causes that cast iron to break because it just can't take the shock of the, uh, the change of temperature that quick. Is there anything that people can do to uh, keep their pipes from freezing and, and uh, maintain them when it gets that cold? Yeah, yeah there is. There's a few calls that we had. Uh, people just always want to remember to shut off their outside faucets uh, in the fall. They want to drain those out so that they're not on. We did have a couple calls for those that froze and broke, uh, those are easy enough to fix by just shutting off inside. But uh, we did have a couple of pipes inside the basement freeze. Uh, there's a lot of older homes in town that have field stone. So you just want to make sure that uh, you want to go down and check that area around your meter and your, your pipes. So uh, if there's any cracks in the foundations there or any holes through there, you want to just make sure you get those sealed up. People that also have uh, known problems in the past can put heating tape on there and plug, plug that in and that will help keep the uh, the line warm enough so that it doesn't freeze for them. All right, terrific. And uh, can you talk about some of the equipment that you have here at the facility as far as uh, snow removal? Yeah, uh, the the guys do a great job. They've got it down to a science. Uh, Mike Manser, who heads the highway department, uh, has a great program in place. And they just, uh, they go out. We have several uh, big trucks that go out with wing plows that uh, plow all the main streets and then they have all, all kinds of smaller pieces we use the back hose uh, down to some of the pickup trucks and then they have uh, I'm not sure the number but there's a, quite a few contractors that they come in that uh, help take care of all the facilities as well and then what they'll do is after a bigger snowstorm like we had I think we had 14 inches in, in one of those storms uh, once the, everything has been pushed back they'll then go up through the center of town and pick up all that snow and remove it just so people can get in and park 
uh, their vehicles again. They'll do snow removal from the schools and some of the other areas, and then they'll bring that all down to the snow, bump, snow dump to make room uh, for that next storm that comes in. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention is uh, we also had to deal with flooding. Uh, not only did we have that 14 inches of snow, we had another three inch snowstorm, and then we had a two inch rainstorm with a 60 degree uh, weather coming in, which uh, just inundated not only the sewer system, but our wells. So we, uh, along with the freezing cold, the snow, uh, we had floods. So I think we hit pretty much every major weather category you could in the last two weeks so that we had to deal with. Um, what's the procedure as far as flooding? You uh, have machines that just remove the water? Uh, well, we just make sure we have all of our waterways open. Uh, the highway opens up all of their drains. We have certain areas uh, like down at our wells that we go and sandbag because we already knew the water was high to begin with and with everything iced over there was so much ice frozen in place from the record cold that there was no place for that water to go so we did have to sandbag around one of our wells and around the doors to our main station to make sure they didn't get in uh, on the sewer side uh, thankfully we had an upgrade to the station a couple years ago some bigger pumps were put in so we were able to keep up uh, pretty well with this storm in the past we've had to have pump trucks come down here and thankfully, uh, we didn't have to go that route at that time. We were just you know, able to keep up with what we had with the upgrades, which, uh, again, um, was just a big help having that stuff in place. Now, you're also a weather spotter for WBZ, and you're pretty good at predicting uh, what weather is to come. Everything you've told me has been pretty much right on so far. Uh, so what is to come? I'm sure everybody wants to know out there, what, what should we expect weather-wise in the yeah. next few weeks, months? Well, i got to say, I can't take credit for that. It's the people that I follow that... Uh, are pretty good. I watch a lot of the people online and a lot of the local meteorologists don't like to uh, go too far out uh, because things can change but uh, a lot of the long-range people are very good at it and basically what's coming up is there's another really cold chunk of air that's in Siberia that's going to make its way around and come here probably mid uh, late next week into the weekend. I think right during the Patriots Super Bowl is where it's going to be the coldest in Minnesota so <laughs> and then after that uh, you know we're supposed to be below temperature uh, for most of uh, February up there if everything falls into place and they were they predicted this last one back in October So we'll see if they're they're right again <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully it won't be as cold as it was in early January. That's for sure Yeah, we were, we were lucky that we had this little break in between because uh, everyone was getting real tired of uh, fixing brakes and plowing So it's been nice to have this little break uh, So hopefully we'll uh, be all rested up if we do get it again and I have to ask, since you're a sports guy, any Super Bowl predictions? I'm taking the Pats. I, I don't know, wanted to prick the points because, uh, you know, they always seem to come back at the end. So it'll probably be close, but I think the Pats will pull it out again. All right, Eric. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Tom. A whole lot of programming is coming up on the HCAM channels. Standing by to tell you all about it is HCAM's promotions coordinator, Matt Clark. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the HCAM Insider. I'm Matt Clark, and here's what's happening this week on HCAM. On Friday, January 26th at 5 p.m., local artists share their work on a special episode of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. And at 6.30 p.m., the Hillers boys basketball team takes on the Norton Lancers, live on HCAM Ed. On Monday, January 29th at 8 p.m., the Hopkinton Youth Commission's Martin Luther King Days of Service will air on a brand new HCAM TV special. On Tuesday, January 30th at 5 p.m., the Hillers boys basketball team takes on the Westwood Wolverines, live on HCAM Ed. And at 6.30 p.m., the Hopkinton Board of Selectmen's meeting will air live on HCAM TV. On Wednesday, January 31st at 7 p.m., Margie and Lisa are back and invite you to join the conversation on a new episode of The Margie and Lisa Show, live on HCAM TV. On Thursday, February 1st at 7 p.m., the Hopkinton School Committee meeting will air live on HCAM TV. And on Friday, February 2nd at 5 p.m., poets gather for a special memorial for Iwata Schneider on a new episode of Wake Up and Smell the Poetry. If you want to know more about all of HCAM shows before they air, then head over to hcam.tv connect, where you can sign up for our HCAM Insider newsletter. Or if you want to know more about what's happening in Hopkinton, you can sign up for our daily news updates. That's all for this week's Insider. I'm Matt Clark, and as always, thanks for watching. Back to you, Tom. Thank you, Matt. That will just about do it for this edition of HCAM News. Don't forget, you can stay up to date with everything Hopkinton by checking out our website, hcam.tv, as well as our Twitter and Facebook page. Be sure to head over to our website to view the full broadcast of Monday's Hopkinton Planning Board meeting and the latest happenings throughout our community. 
If you have a Hopkinton related video, photo, or story idea, I want to hear from you. Email me at news at hcam.tv. With your help, we'll cover even more of our community. For everyone here at HCAM, I'm Tom Nappy. We leave you now with the current community listings and upcoming government meetings. As always, thanks for watching HCAM News. Take care and enjoy the rest of your day. As part of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service activities, volunteers helped make scarves, blankets, hats, and other clothing items for donation at St. John's Parish. Today we have the St. John's Middle School Youth Group working on three different service projects. The first, which is happening in this room, is to make um, blankets for babies. Every baby that gets baptized here at St. John's receives a blanket um, for the, after their baptism, so that's what these will go to. Then in another room, we have children knitting uh, little hats for infants, and we're going to be giving them to a group in Framingham called Birthright, and they help um, women, particularly unwed mothers, who do decide to have their baby and keep it, get um, the proper education they need, proper all the supplies for a baby, so all those babies will, that's where we'll donate these hats. And then the third activity that we have going on right now are to create scarves, and those scarves next weekend, our high school um, youth group will be going into Boston to distribute blessing bags to different homeless people. So the scarves will go in that bags, along with other things we've collected, socks, mittens, toothpaste, toothbrush, and things like that. So those are the three projects we have here today. A wide array of activities took place during the Martin Luther King Jr. Day at Hopkinton Middle School. In addition to a few presentations, Volunteer community members, scouts, and students helped give back to those.